Okay, everybody. Boker Tov. Welcome back to our Sunday morning coffee and learning. And uh, today we will be learning Pirkei Avot, ethics, ethics of the Fathers, or Ethics of Our Fathers, whichever way works for me. Chapter 3. And, uh, you know, it's Sunday morning, so we're all a little relaxed, and uh, we allow ourselves to, uh, to explore Abyssala, to explore a little bit. First, we'll start with a bracha, thanking the Almighty for this wonderful drink. Baruch ata adinoi eleheinu melech ha'elam shehakoil nihiyo bidvarei. Very nice to hear you all say amen. Very proud of all of us. Okay. So we're going to begin here with the first Mishnah in chapter 3. And at the surface level, the Mishnah seems a bit morbid. But then we will explain. So first I'll read the Hebrew and translate to English. And then we'll try to delve in a little bit deeper and have some uh, discussion about what's going on over here. So the Mishnah begins. Akavya ben Mahalalel Oimer. Akavya, the son of Mahalalel, says the following. Histakel, Akavya ben Mahalalel, just to give you a little background. Um, Akavya ben Mahalalel was a contemporary of the famous Hillel. For those of you who know the sages of the Talmud, Hillel being one of the greatest sage of the Talmud. Um, and his... Uh, colleague here is Akavya ben Mahalalil and he shares this following ethical teaching. The Talmud says that Akavya ben Mahalalil was so righteous that when the Jews were all in the courtyard of the temple doing the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb before, before, uh, before Pesach, uh, basically all the entire Jewish nation would make a pilgrimage and do the Paschal Lamb in different shifts. But the Talmud says the following, I'm reading over here. Translation of Talmud Tractate Brachot. He says that there was <clears throat> that whenever the courtyard of the holy temple was crowded with with people offering the Paschal Lamb, there was never anyone present who was as great as Akavya in wisdom, purity, and piety. So this is who Akavya Bamalal was. So Akavya Bamalal Oimer Akavya Bamalal says the following: His stakel bishloishadvarim. You should reflect upon three things this was his ethical continuous teaching you should reflect reflect on three things and you will not come to the hands of sin and as commentaries point out the hands of sin means that not only is it that you will not come to sin ethics of the fathers is not coming to teach you the basics it's coming to teach you beyond the basics it comes to tell you that you will not even come to the hands of sin, even something distant from sin. What are the three things? So he says like this, Dam ayin basa, know where you came from. That's number one. Ula'an ato hoilech, and where you are going to. And finally he says, Velifne mi ato osid litoin din vecheshben. And to who you are destined to give a judgment and an accounting. Okay. But he's not finished. Now he elaborates. And this is where somewhat the morbid part comes in a little bit. He says, Mi ayin basa, where are you coming from? He says, Mi tipa surucha, you're coming from a putrid drop. Sounds exciting, right? And then he says, And to where are you headed to? Where are you going to? You're going to a place of dust, maggots, and worms. And before whom are you destined to give a judgment and an accounting? So he, 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 he specifies and he says, before the Supreme King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed is He. Okay, let's talk about this, Abyssalah. Let's talk about this a little bit. And, um, and let's discuss it with some of the commentaries. And then I think we'll also get to a second Mishnah as well. Because the second Mishnah, which is Mishnah Beis, 
is also very relevant to the time we're in. So let's relax. This is not one of these two minute, you know, or a meme. This is learning. So let's focus. Let's zero in over here. And with God's help, I shall be able to give over the message of the Mishnah and the commentaries and we should all uh, grow from it. So <clears throat> let's start all over again. Akavya ben Malal al Akavya ben Malal says the following. Histakel b'shloi shodvarim. So the first question that the Mishnah comes to mind is, why does he even have to say, look into three things? I mean, we could count, we could do math. It's not that complicated. Many of the Mishnahs here in, in the chat Ethics of the Fathers have sayings divided into three. You know, the sages saying three of their teachings. So why does he even have to begin and say, histakel, reflect upon three things that seems to be unnecessary okay so so commentaries points out and the Rebbe points out when I say the Rebbe I mean my saintly teacher Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson so he points out the following he says his is a message unto itself you always have to focus and reflect on three things what are those three things you have to reflect on the fact that there's a God that created us there's a superpower, there's a God Almighty that's always watching over us, that's in control of our every day-to-day -day life. He's not just a God that created the world thousands of years ago. Number two, you have to know that you, that you, are, you exist, that you know. And number three, you have to be conscious that there's a world out there. And there's a world that needs cultivating. There's a world that needs influencing. There's a world that needs influencing in the positive. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mission and purpose that you have in this world as it relates to the world. You can't, can, you can't just seclude yourself and say, I just got to take care of myself. I just got to make sure you know, that I exist and that my needs and wants are met. Then there's only two. There's God and you. No, there's three things. You have to, if you want to make sure that you don't come Lidea Vera to even close to a sin, you always have to be conscious of these three things. Shlosha Dvarim. There's God, there's me, and what I'm needed for in terms of making the world and people around me better. What their needs are, what the world needs are. How do, how do I refine and elevate and make the world a better place, etc. So always is Takal Shlosha Dvarim. Okay, let's move on. And for some of the new people who joined here, I want to again stress, this is not a two-minute, you know, snap, uh, uh, tick-tock Mishnah. This is, we're learning. It's Sunday morning, grab a coffee, say L'chaim on some, and, and, and let's, let's learn. Then he continues, and he says the same thing, seemingly repeats the same thing. It is known that the Mishnah's language is very precise. And the Mishnah's language is is every word is is measured the the way the Talmud is structured for those who are new to the Talmud is every Talmud page there's first a Mishnah and then which is from the earlier sages and then the Talmud goes on to elaborate and to explore and to articulate and to analyze take apart the Mishnah which could go for pages and pages so the Mishnah is very precise, very short. Here the Mishnah seems to, besides what we just explained, Shlosh Devarim, seems to be re repeat itself. It then it goes in ahead and tells us, know where you came from, know where you're going, know who you're going to give an accounting for. And then the Mishnah repeats, where did you come from? For a future drop. Where are you going? To a place of, 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 um, of maggots and worms. The Mishnah could have just said the second part, Ma'ayim Basa Metipa Shurucha, where you come from, maggots. Why does it first say a general statement, where you come from, where you're going, and who you're going to give judgment? So as commentaries point out, and again, this is based very much on the Rebbe's teaching, that the Mishnah is actually talking to two different parts of ourself. The Mishnah, or to two different people, or two parts of ourself. Well, let's, let's, let's address it to two different types of people. The Mishnah is talking to the person, the first statement is talking to a more soul-oriented person. A person who's struggling and wants to better themselves and is struggling with their spirituality and their holiness. That's who the first part statement of this 
know where you came from without specifying the details. So there the Mishnah is talking to the person who is a soul type of person and the person who is struggling, wants to be better, is conscientious. And the Mishnah over there is saying to that person, Herzachain, listen, don't be discouraged, know where you came from. Me'ayin basa in Hebrew could also mean me'ayin from where could also mean in, in Kabbalistic and Hasidic teachings because ayin means nothing. What does that mean, nothing? You know you came from nothing. Meaning know that you came from a level that is so powerful that it cannot be defined. It's so lofty. The soul of a person which is a part of Hashem is from such a lofty level that me'ayin, it could be considered like like nothing. Let me, let, me, let me articulate, let me explain that for a moment within uh, the, the world that we live in right now which will allow us to understand that. The more something is tangible in a sense, the more something is visual to our physical, material self, the actually the more finite, the less powerful it is. And what's the biggest evidence? You can see this from the coronavirus. It is totally non-visual to our eye, which is part of the reason why it is so potent and so powerful and so deadly. And that's in the negative. In the holiness, in the side of Kedush, in the side of holiness, whatever you could see, even if it's good, is not as powerful than something that is not visual because of its power, because therefore it doesn't have the limitations, it doesn't have a beginning and an end in the typical sense. So da, when you are struggling with becoming better, correct? You should know, me'ayin basa. Know that you come from the level of ayin. Your soul is so powerful, is so one. God blew within you a neshame, a holy spark of holiness of Kedusha, and that comes from a level that's ayin, that we cannot define, we cannot, we cannot measure it because it's so powerful. So don't be discouraged. On the contrary, you could achieve far greater than you think you can achieve. And where are you going to? You should know that your neshama, your soul came down in this world not just uh, to, to have ice cream, not just to have a good piece of steak, as my spiritual mentor used to say. Your soul didn't come down here just to, or for the struggles that we have in the, in, in the, in the negative sense of it. You should know that this, your soul came down to this world. You will go to a place which is far greater than actually the place that you've even come from. And that's related to the word la'on, which I will not, spec- will not go into details now based on teachings of Hasidus. But on the simpler level, you're in this world because of the power of your neshama to allow you to reach to a much greater height which you will achieve after 120 it's not only after 120 it's every single day when you do an act of goodness when you do an act of holiness when you do a mitzvah and then you're going to be standing before the kings of kings and give an accounting you know why you're going to give an accounting you know why? Because of your greatness. Because, you know, you only, and we mentioned this last week, you only hold someone accountable for something that they have the power to do. Something they don't have the power to do, you don't hold them accountable for. You don't expect from a child that which they cannot do. You don't expect from, 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 from an employee that what they cannot do. But here, the Mishnah, Akavi ben Malal is saying, we are going to be standing before the king of kings and give an accounting. Which means that God has, a, a, God Almighty has an expectation from us. That is a tremendous encouragement. Okay, so that's level number two. The third section of this Mishnah, since you're all in a good mood, the third section of this Mishnah comes and tells us Azoi comes and tells us as the Zos Wissen Sein you should know this third section of the Mishnah is talking to our physical urges to our physical temptations to our materialistic drives that's what the third section of the Mishnah is coming to is, is addressing the Mishnah is now addressing the person who is very materialistic who is only thinking about what his body desires and his cravings and satisfying his 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 own his own uh, 
his own drives, etc. So here the mission is coming and the third level is to the lowest element over here. And here the Mishnah is saying, here the Mishnah gets down to the to the to the morbid part. May I and boss, where are you coming from? If you are so into just materialistic pursuits and so on, you should know Mitipa Surucha, your body, if you're just trying to satisfy your body, your body comes from a putrid drop. If all of life is just about, you know, we live once and let us give in and enjoy all the pleasures that this world has to offer, that's all that it's about. You know where your body's going to head to? Your body's heading to to a place of maggots, a place of worms. And trust me, maggots and worms, we know it's not. I once came home from a trip in New York and we forgot to, we forgot to take care of our freezer. And uh, I came back, a freezer was full of frozen chicken. And trust me, it, <laughs> it wasn't good. We, saw, we went on a trip and there was a problem. We forgot to take care of it. We came back, we opened up the freezer, full of maggots we just, and it was it was disgusting and it was terrible to get rid of this is not meant to be morbid over here but the Mishnah wants to talk to the the Mishnah is highlighting this because he wants the Mishnah while we're still alive we're, we're not maggots of course and while we're still alive we have the choice to focus on our Nisham and our soul so the third section of the Mishnah is telling you what are you just you're living life to satisfy your body your physical body that's what life is about what do you think it is? And finally, the Mishnah says to this person, again, are you just into, into, into physicality? You're going to hold an accounting. And by the way, as a, as a somewhat of a side note, let me back up for a moment before we get to the side note. So I want to also sort of connect this to to the Mishnah, to, sorry, to the, the times that we're going through over here. Just a second, I'm looking inside for a moment, so don't, uh, I don't want to lose you, hold on. So um, here, the Mishnah um, is telling us that, um, the Mishnah over here is telling us that we're now in the coronavirus situation. So here again, for the most part, what we're being, what we're, I don't know for the most part, but to a, 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 to a big degree, what we're being denied is some of the materialistic pleasures, but more the spiritual pleasures, the ability to learn, to study, to lift up a phone, help somebody, and that was the neshama, our soul type of activities, a prayer, opening up, studying Torah, those things for the most part are not being affected for the most part. So therefore, this Mishnah is telling us, know where you came from, talking about the positive end of it. Know where you're going to. Know that you're being held, that your, your work is so valuable. Don't be discouraged by some of the physical limitations. Focus on the spiritual. And um, with regards to the physical, just remember that it's only physical. There's a known story. I'm reading here a story from a children's Pirkei Avot book. And the story goes like this. A wealthy man left two wills for his family. One to be opened upon his passing and the other at the end of the Shloshim. Well, 30 days after his passing, I'm sorry, when he passed away, his family rushed to open the will and found the instructions that he left them confused. Their father requested to be buried in a pair of socks. You heard? You listening? They rushed to the Hever Kaddisha with their request, but no amount of arguing could change the halacha, which means Jewish law, that one may not be buried in anything other than his simple tachrichim. Tachrichim means his shrouds. The reason why we bury some in shrouds, and I'm going to mention this now, because why not bring in a, something of a Jewish law, and as a rabbi, definitely officiate by plenty of, of burials, and often I get the question, can't we bury him in a suit? Can't we bury him, you know, uh, looking so presentable? So the reason why... A person is buried in the shrouds. The halachic reason is, the Talmud tells us that Rabbi Gamliel, one of the, again, uh, main and uh, most famous sages of the Talmud, Rabbi Gamliel instituted that a person should be buried in the shrouds because, or only in shrouds, so that's not to embarrass those who don't have. And it came about through a story that there was a family who they were perceived to be a wealthy family, but when their 
the father of the family, the patriarch of the family passed away, they were so embarrassed that they couldn't properly prepare him as for what his perceived stature was, that they just left him and, and they abandoned him. So Rabbi Akiva from then on made a takanai, may he instituted, that every single person who passes away, rich or poor, should be buried in simple shrouds. But here this story maybe will give us a little a deeper insight. So he says like this, whatever, going back to the story, whatever they try to do to get the Hebra Kadisha to uh, bury him in a sax, didn't help. Didn't help. So after the Shloshim, the family opened the second will. It read as follows, by now you certainly know that you couldn't bury me in my socks. This should be an important lesson for you. No matter how much money you make in this world, none of it can come with you to the world to, the world to come. Even a simple pair of socks cannot be taken. So my dear children, this is part of his will, when you divide my money, don't fight about it. Because the only thing that stays with you forever is Torah and mitzvahs. So this is a very important message that Akavi Malala is telling us to both sides. He's telling us to our spiritual neshama self, know what you have and what you possess and how great you are. And to our temptation side, our desire to be, to, 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 to give in to our cravings and so on, remember what the body is about. Remember, in simple terms, remember how lofty your soul is, where it came from, and how high you could, you could rise and affect the world around you, and how low you could fall by just giving in to your temptations. Finally, I also want to mention one thing. It's a famous, it's a famous saying, which the Baal Shem Tov also expounds upon, and I want to mention this in, in conclusion of this Mishnah. The Mishnah says an interesting thing. The Mishnah says that when you contemplate where you're going, you should contemplate on the fact of who you're going to give a din v'cheshben. Who you're going to give, uh, literally din v'cheshben means um, a judgment and accounting. Okay, din means judgment, cheshben means accounting. And this has become part of the vernacular. A lot of times in business you say, I want a din v'cheshben. I want, I want a din v'cheshven, I want a judgment, I want an accounting. Taken, this is a language taken from this mission. Commentaries ask, why does it say judgment and accounting? It would seemingly be more appropriate to say cheshben v'din. Cheshboin v'din. You should make an accounting and then judgment, which comes first. First comes the judgment, uh, sorry, first comes the accounting, then comes the, the din. The chesh, the, 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 then comes the judgment. So the Medr Shmuel, I believe it is, and the Baal Shem Tov expounds upon this, says like this. He says something profound. There's a statement later in this chapter that says, We exact uh, punishment or, or payment from a person based on his knowledge and his and and, and without his knowledge. What does that mean? Says the Baal Shem Tov and also based on this question we just asked. The Baal Shem Tov says the following. When we come before the heavenly court after our time is up, one of the methods of how we are judged is how we judged others. The way we judged others in the exact same situation, the way we pass judgment on someone else, that's how the court judges us. In other words, whenever we see someone else doing something, and by the way, this is my own little addition here, very often we are judgmental of others when we see in them a weakness that we have. But we don't want to deal with it with ourselves, so we pass judgment on somebody else. So, we exact payment from a person based on his knowledge and not his knowledge, or his non-knowledge, what does that mean? When you're passing judgment on someone else, you're passing judgment on yourself. That's the knowledge part. But you don't realize that you're passing judgment on yourself. So when you come up after 120, so, <clears throat> so the mission over here says, <laughs> judgment and accounting. They look at all the judgments. It's all recorded. They look at all the judgments of how you've judged others. That's what they take out first. And then they make an accounting of how to apply it to yourself. So be very, very careful 
of how to judge others because essentially you're, ju- you're being your own judge. And that is this Mishnah. So, so, so that's one Mishnah here of Ethics of the Fathers. And then I want to, and I don't know if we'll get to the entire Mishnah, but I do want to mention this Mishnah. And, um, you know, rabbis sometimes have to say things that maybe is a little risky. I don't know. But as I say in every class, you're going to learn a little Yiddish. A side benefit here, an additional benefit of learning Torah here. But I want to make it very, very clear. This is not a political statement, so that should grab your attention. And anytime you speak with Jews about politics, you risk getting, uh, getting an arrow, getting shot, who knows what. But this is not... This is, but nevertheless, this is not about, this is a Mishnah, it's the next Mishnah. And I said everything is by divine providence, so we'll reach, we'll learn this Mishnah. And um, so bear with me over here. Rabbi Hanina Zgana Koenim, and I see one of my friends is watching, so, <laughs> no, just kidding over here. Okay, Rabbi Hanina Zgana Koenim, Rabbi Hanina, who was the Zgan, he was the, he was the assistant of the of the high priest why was he only an assistant for all his years because he lived during a time when the job of high priest was basically paid was bribed it was the russia the, the romans sorry at that time ruled and the high priest calling him would bribe the romans to become the high priest <clears throat> so they the high priests of his time weren't weren't that righteous but Rabbi Hanina always was the assistant priest that was not a bribed position and he was rabbi Hanina, the holy rabbi Hanina. He says the following statement. He says like this. You should pray for the welfare, welfare of the kingdom. Why should you pray for the welfare of the kingdom? So he says like this. Because if there isn't fear for the kingdom. A man would swallow his fellow alive. Excuse me. So in the simple meaning, I'm, I'm quoting here, I'm reading here a Sephorna. The Herst, I'm reading here a Sephorna. The Sephorna says the following. Um, this is the, he says, even the rule of a corrupt king, like the majority of Jewish kings during the Second Temple era, is better than anarchy. That's what the Sephorna says. Where every person is spend, spent to fend, uh, to, to, for every person is forced to spend his life fending for their very own existence. So basically the Mishnah over here is saying, Hanina lived in a time where there was corruption. And not only that, he says, the Meiri adds, that even you should pray for the, for the welfare of all governments. Correct? We know that on Sukkot, the, every Sukkot we would bring uh, uh, we would bring sacrifices for all we would bring sacrifices and offer prayer for the well-being of the of all the nations of the gover- of the governments and the kingdom the kings the monarchies of all the nations of the world it also spiritually means you should re- you should pray for the welfare of God's kingship that God's kingship should be known and heard and, and e- throughout the world now um, why am I saying this? I'm saying this, and this is where the risky part is, that I actually just saw a very beautiful video put out by former President George Bush. And uh, basically, he's praying for the well-being of, 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 all of, the, of all citizens of the United States and, um, and for a time of unity. And it reminds me, interestingly enough, because one of the commentaries says, Ave mispalo bushloi meshal malchus. You should pray for the peace of the, of the government. So, again, simply it means is that there should be government, because if there's not government, because if not government, there's anarchy. And anarchy is, is worse than corrupt government. So says the Sifarna. Some might argue that corrupt government is, is, worse than, is, is, is worse than anarchy, but I'm just telling you what the commentaries are saying over there. One of the commentaries says, "Ave mispalo b'shloi moshal malchus." You should pray for the peace within the government. I thought that's very, very apropos because we're living in a time when, regardless of which political side you're you're, you're on, right, left, far right, far left, somewhere in the middle, 
uh, the passions of 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 this country is is concerning. That's all I'll say. It's concerning the passion and the vision in the government and amongst people of how much um, what I have seen families friends breaking up because of different political um, ideology sides etc it's almost like a it's almost like a boxing match and worse so it's I thought when I learned this Mishnah this 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 week which is chapter 2 of a Mispalel that you should pray that there should be peace within government and and you could apply because if not one swallows up the other is a statement not only about society it's a statement of government and society that if there isn't proper peace proper dialogue proper proper communication peaceful um, disagreement within government so that they could govern and pre in peace then it's tremendously hurtful hurtful is an understatement of government and then there's anarchy if there's not shalom within malchus and not peace in government then men people swallow each other up and, and we see that happening people will will do things to even go as far as harm each other in a real way because there are disagreements because there is not peace within the kingship so you have to pray every day I don't know if every day but Akavi Mal says you should pray you should pray that there should be peace within the government there's always going to be different sides within the government there's always going to be different different positions says Akavya ben Malalil you should pray for peace within the government you should pay pray that that there is harmony that there is um, productive ways of disagree of disagreement so that there should not be and interestingly enough just to, to end off to move away from that discussion to end off that that um, there's also a an explanation that where is this holding okay Um, bear with me here for a moment so that I don't lose you oh so here I want to end off with a Hasidic saying which I think let me see who this is from this is from the Rebbe that also have a mispal malchus means like this that very often a person might take themselves too seriously to the extent that they are dismissive of others and they only and another person only exists as far as what's good for him or her in other words you're here to satisfy me uh, what I could get what what could you what have you done for me lately what could I get out of you and if you're not there in some way that I could benefit then I have no use of you first taste so <clears throat> so what I want to so what the mission is saying is that if you have that kind of ego and that kind of uh, self-importance that you start swallowing up somebody else meaning the other person doesn't exist you, you see that by the way I, I want to use the extreme so that we understand it you, there are people that we all know that when you come into their presence they're so full of themselves that everyone else ceases to exist they have to be the focus of attention they have to be the center of attention they have to they are the only one uh, talking I mean the, people have different ways of expressing that but when you're in their presence and I'm talking sort of in a negative way you're swallowed up and by the way that extends to a marriage also that extends sometimes to a friendship an unhealthy friendship where one personality is so dominant that the other person ceases to exist one swallows the other how do you remedy that? How do you heal yourself from that? You have to introduce Malchus. Malchus means the kingship of God Almighty. When you introduce and you think about the fact that you, in the eyes of Hashem, in the eyes of the King of all kings, we're all equal, we're all so small, by introducing that into your mind and into your heart, that's how you're going to make sure that you don't swallow up the other person. So that's on a, on a spiritual level what the mission over here means uh, with, with your God. You should pray for Shloim Shal Malchus. You should pray for the well-being of Malchus. So, <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been nice learning Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers. There's so many messages over here. I wanted to maybe also discuss a lesson from the Sphira, but we're sort of running out of time. I think we'll do it next week, perhaps. Hopefully, we'll see. 
and uh, thank you for joining us. Meanwhile, everybody should stay safe. Everybody should stay healthy. I see uh, over here there's an individual that every time I give class, he's very concerned about my well-being. So I want him to know that I am outside in my own backyard and being very safe and uh, very healthy and all is good. So uh, the same I say to all of you, stay safe, stay healthy, be responsible. Um, and, uh, and like the Mishnah says, make sure <clears throat> that not only don't you s not swallow up someone else, but think about all the people that you could reach out and, uh, and um, uplift them. The, this past week, I was in the office, <clears throat> and there was a couple of seniors in our office you know, that come to class and so on, and we haven't seen them for a while. <clears throat> Without, of course, mentioning names, I asked someone to, to keep in touch with them, but it turns out that for whatever reason, it, it wasn't the case. I said to the secretary, let's call so-and-so, see how they're doing. We called them up, and this was a senior in the community, and they literally broke down crying. They were so lonely, and on the other hand, they were so appreciative that somebody reached out and called them. So this is, this is, the, this is what the mission is saying. There is focusing on the materialism of all this corona, meaning, what do I need? What am I losing? What, 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 am, I, what am I not getting? And there's, and there's the ability to go ahead and focus on what Akavim Lalo says is what your soul is, your spirit, your kindness, your goodness, and that you can reach out to people and uplift them. There are so many people out there that just a few a, a phone call, or even more so, do you need something? Do you need shopping? Do you need a coupon? Do you need fifteen dollars? Whatever it is, you never know. There's, everybody could be creative in this area. Now is an opportunity like never before. So based on the mission that we learned today, go ahead and do this. Um, spend a moment. Meditating on this mission and let it motivate you to be a soul type of person, and uh, and I'm sure you'll be successful and make the world around you a better world. Everybody, Ashokach, thank you for watching, thank you for listening. It's always good to share words of Torah, words of inspiration with others, so I encourage you to go ahead and share it with others. Zai Gesund.